Welcome everyone to the Transmark Foundation monthly community meeting for September 2016. Just as a reminder, this meeting will be recorded for uh, offline viewing and be posted to the uh, Foundation's website at transmarkfoundation.org, um, as, well as, uh, as well as the materials, the uh, slide packs and so forth. Um, so. Uh, today's agenda is uh, a couple of the usual recurring items, a, a development update on the 16.2 and 17.1 projects, an update on the uh, Transmart annual meeting, which is uh, coming out very soon, and then our guest today is Raphael Rosengarten from Junialis, who's going to uh, present on their, uh, their suite of software called Expressions tools and software which complement the Transmart effort. So we'll start with the development update and the, uh, the platform roadmap. And Rudy, I will hand it over to you and uh, I can advance the slides as you direct. Okay, uh, thanks Keith. Next slide. So this is the uh, plan that we had put forth um, a while back now. And uh, phase one was 16.1 project, which was released in the spring. Uh, we are working hard to get 16.2 out, and I'll give you a quick update on that. Uh, and 17.1 project is also underway and moving along. Uh, Keith will give an update on that. Uh, and then 17.2 is um, what we're beginning to, to think about now. And actually, we will have a session uh, discussion group on uh, both 17.2 and looking at, towards version 18 uh, at the annual meeting. So more to come there. Uh, next slide. Uh, just generally, uh, you know, kind of our, our view of the world, how we think these will unfold. Um, we did have the release of 16.1 in the spring, as I said. We're, we're working hard to get 16.2 out. Um, target had been uh, like October, it was probably slipping a little bit, and I'll talk about that. 17.1 uh, is moving ahead to, to come out in the first. Um, half of uh, 2017, and the target for 17.2 is by the end of 2017. Next slide. So on the uh, the platform release 16.2, we've been working on, on this for a couple of months now. Uh, our product, um, our PMC, our, our product management committee uh, has been formed and we've been working uh, to pull uh, all the pieces together. Uh, this is the short list of the, the types of uh, the, the new capabilities. Uh, it will introduce SmartR uh, plugin for the, the project, um, the Ingenuity Pathway Analysis Connector, which will be a, an additional workflow within SmartR. And uh, both of these are work being done by ITTM. Uh, there will be an XNet uh, image platform interface uh, to Transmart. Uh, this is being work being done at Imperial. Uh, Thomson Reuters working with the University of Liverpool uh, has integrated P-Link um, integration into GWAS to bring in P-Link data. There have been a number of extensions also to GWAS and the work that Pfizer has done originally, and um, this will also be brought in. Uh, there will be some additions to um, handling omics data from J&J &J as part of their eTrix and trade work, uh, and this will be uh, also another component. Uh, and then the Metacore and Genome Browser plugins uh, will come back. Uh, these were in uh, I think early releases, they had some issues. And so we've been working to get these uh, also completed and available. Uh, and finally, there have been a number of ETL improvements. Uh, we've been looking at places, different types of data sets that have a long time, both on import and on export, uh, and have found that uh, we've been able to do some improvements here uh, with some code change uh, to, to dramatically improve uh, some of these data sets that are really been uh, causing some issues in terms of loading of these pieces. Next slide. So I described the development process last time a bit. Uh, we have established an alpha branch for version 16.2. Uh, this has uh, all of the 16.1 uh, uh, code as well as some additional patches and fixes that have come along since then. Uh, we have then merged the SmartR project fully into the alpha branch. The SmartR team has done that. Uh, and uh, we are doing automated builds. We are introducing some automated testing uh, along the way, and uh, as this has gone very smoothly, in fact, uh, we've, we've begun bringing in the other pieces um, one by one into the alpha branch. And so 
uh, approximately each week or every couple of days, another uh, one of the components that were on the last slide is being brought in to the um, to the Alpha uh, branch, and uh, we're continuing to do this. We were hoping to have this completed by the end of September. It's taking a little bit longer than that. Uh, we hit into some no technical issues, but uh, vacation time uh, in August has uh, chewed up a bit of our schedule. And so um, we expect, um, if not the end of September, with the first work week or two in October to have a complete uh, code complete uh, 16.2 Alpha. This will go through some quick, you know, some testing internally, and then we hope to have the beta test uh, early to, to mid-October. And certainly by the time we come to the annual meeting uh, in San Diego, we expect to be fully into beta test. And then we'll run the beta test uh, about four to six weeks uh, and have a final release uh, in uh, early to mid-November. Uh, we're well on track uh, right now. Uh, we don't see any major issues uh, cropping up, but we'll see. Uh, these next uh, two or three weeks are, are really critical, but um, things are looking pretty solid, and uh, we're looking forward to getting this release completed. I think that's it. Next slide. Over. Uh, this just shows um, just the schedule, approximately where we are. Uh, here we are now into into September. Um, we're hoping we're hoping the beta testing done in September. It's going to take an uh, extra week or two, possibly, but um, the beta test will run through October. Uh, certainly at the annual meeting, uh, and then final acceptance testing will um, will get the release out. Uh, as I said, we're using our new uh, development process, and so we're we're carefully uh, working through the the integration. We're doing integration testing, uh, and also uh, with a, a fairly uh, regulated code check in and release process uh, as we move from the alpha to the actual formal beta a version of the code. So. Uh, again, you know, I think things are going quite well, and we're we're looking forward to, to getting this completed. I think that's it now, Keith. Over to you. Okay. Um, so uh, thanks, Rudy, and I'm going to give an update now on the uh, progress of the 17.1 project, which is running concurrently with 16.2. Um, Right now, we're in week 38, and uh, the PMC and the Hive have been really busy over the last several weeks uh, refining the design document. Um, so just uh, to remind everyone, this, this project is being run on a fairly strict sort of waterfall development model, not as a highly interactive project, and that's largely in the interest of, of time and keeping the project moving forward given the number of stakeholders that are involved. Um, so we've produced three major deliverables uh, for the first stage of the project, and those deliverables are currently waiting for approval from the governing committee, which we expect to get very shortly. And once we have that approval, uh, we can move in and the Hive can move on to the, the stage of uh, actually building the product in accordance with the design that's been, that's been proposed. Um, they are currently working, even though we don't have the formal approval from the governing committee, the Hive has been working on updating the uh, dependencies for the product so that uh, we'll be up to date with respect to Grails and Java, for example. Um, we talked about doing some of that work in 16.2, but uh, I think 17.1 is going to be the release that really helps us uh, upgrade everything so that we're keeping current and not forcing users to, uh, to hold back on versions of some of their dependencies. Um, so anyway, uh, the, the main deliverables in stage one were the project plan, the requirements refinement, which took a few weeks, and uh, we've got all the requirements in the Hive's JIRA repository for the, uh, for the project. And then the design document, which is a pretty extensive document. It's 60-some-odd uh, pages right now, and really lays out in, in quite a bit of detail uh, not just what the system's going to do, but how it's going to do it. Um, we've been getting some input back from the I2B2 community, um, and we, we made a, a small change to some of the schema uh, changes for 17.1 uh, as a result of that. But we hope to have uh, the governing committee's approval very soon, and then uh, the build phase will begin in earnest. As you can see, it's a fairly, uh, you know, the timelines for this project are fairly tight. That, that's why we want to uh, conduct it in, in a fairly uh, sequential manner here and make sure that we have everything planned up front before we start to actually build things. Um, and in particular, um, 
we need to start uh, acceptance test planning at the same time that the build phase is going on. Um, so it's, it's a fair amount of work on the part of the PMC and the Transmart Pro sponsors of the project uh, to either find or develop appropriate test data and then develop the acceptance tests that will determine that the system in fact does what we hope that it will. Um, so like I say, some we're, we're currently in the early phases of, of build, you know, just trying to get the, uh, the, the groundwork laid for uh, the coding proper. Um, while that's going on as well, we're doing some additional release planning for the uh, targeted release date of April of next year. And just to remind everyone, that essentially covers the, uh, the development that has to take place above and beyond uh, the project that the Hive is uh, implementing. So the Hive is focused very much on building a small stable core with a set of stable APIs that are well documented. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of an exciting development, at least for me. I, I am the sort of person who can get excited about good documentation. Um, so they're really working on producing a platform that should be very solid and, uh, and very well suited to further development of the platform. So uh, that's the goal of the 17.1 project. The 17.1 release will then add some of the functionality like MTL upgrades and some UI development to, re to make it uh, possible to exploit the new functionality in 17.1. In particular, the um, the support for longitudinal data, uh, the integration with Arvados and, and some of the other features. So the project itself uh, is, is currently scheduled to wrap up uh, in the very early part of next year. The release, however, will follow by a few months following some additional integration uh, and additional development and testing. Um, so that is the current status, again, uh, We've, uh, we've gotten through the early, the first stage of the project where we've done the bulk of the planning and right up through the design and the build phase is uh, currently uh, on deck. Um, so with that, uh, I'll turn it back to Rudy for an update on the annual meeting in October. Uh, super, thanks, thanks Keith. Um, next slide. So as we've been uh, talking about, the annual meeting is coming uh, soon. Um, it's scheduled for October 25th to 27th on the campus of the, UC, uh, the University of California at San Diego, UCSD. Um, and uh, we will, uh, I think we've got a pretty exciting uh, agenda pulled together for you uh, that includes uh, six keynote speakers. We have about 42 talks that we're, we're trying to, to fit in. Uh, a little bit different this year, uh, trying to have uh, at each session uh, a session topic and then uh, at the end of each session a panel discussion of the speakers to have a little more open discussion uh, about the particular topic. Uh, we're also putting together a number of workshops uh, that will also be uh, available and I'll uh, go quickly through and describe that for you. Uh, it, it is taking place at UCSD at Atkinson, Atkinson's Hall. Uh, which is really a, a state-of-the-art facility, a lot of lovely uh, capabilities for us to take advantage of, uh, including a, a 64 megapixel tiled display wall. Uh, and actually our first keynote, uh, Larry Smarr, will be um, describing his work and uh, showing uh, some, of the, um, some of the use of this um, uh, a huge pixel display. Um, and uh, when we're finished, we'll walk into the next room and actually see the display in operation. So it's good to, uh, I think that'd be exciting to, to take a look at that. Next slide. We'll be following uh, the same format as we have been, a three-day meeting um, with uh, keynotes uh, starting you know, in each of the sessions and then a number of scientific and technical sessions uh, as we roll through uh, the week. Uh, next slide. I know this is hard to read, but um, all the details, of course, are on the website. Uh, here are our keynotes, um, who will be uh, talking on a number of topics that uh, I think are very, very interesting, um, you know, from, you know, different uses of uh, these types of technologies, some specific uh, areas of, of uh, scientific research, uh, the interesting uh, on the Elixir project, uh, uh, some, more, some discussion about uh, data uh, provenance and uh, 
development of uh, ontologies uh, and um, also some uh, we'll have a dinner speaker uh, Clanthus will be discussing the, uh, the San Diego uh, biotech community uh, which I think will be interesting to, to hear about that over dinner next slide our scientific and technical sessions um, span uh, eight different tracks uh, including scientific applications uh, of the use of Transmart, uh, some uh, you know description of the 16.2 platform release, uh, a couple of sessions on data standards and the open data, uh, a session on integrating clinical data and I2B2, uh, some uh, a discussion about our centers of excellence, uh, and also a session on Open Bell. So it'll be uh, I think quite interesting, and we will conclude on the last day in the afternoon with a, a, a fairly, uh, hopefully, extensive discussion on our, our roadmap. Where uh, do we see things going, uh, both scientifically and translational research, uh, as well as um, technologically, and um, just get a chance to really uh, try to talk about what do, uh, what do you all think and what do, what do we think we should be going in terms of the, the direction uh, of the Transmart platform. Next slide. We're also working on a number of uh, workshops uh, that we're putting together, including some training. Uh, the Hive has got a couple of very interesting technical sessions that uh, they're putting together uh, on actually using and developing uh, for the platform, uh, some data science. Uh, this was a, a popular course that they taught this year for us. Uh, Keith Elston will lead a session on OpenBell and uh, talk a little bit about what we're doing and uh, have a chance to really think about where we should be going. Um, Julie will lead a discussion on open data and some of some of the issues in open data and what that means and um, you know what how much data is enough data uh, and Keith um, I think we'll be putting together a session on uh, 17.1 next slide <clears throat> so we still need your help um, we're, we're light on posters uh, we certainly would, would welcome anyone who has posters to submit um, you can do that on the website uh, we need you to register. We're trying to plan the food and the different activities, and so make sure that we have, you know, a proper um, uh, amounts of everything. So please, please, if you're coming, please um, register soon. The um, the local hotel information. I apologize. We thought we were going to have this done. I'm hoping in another day or two we'll have hotel information up on the website, uh, and there's still sponsorship opportunities if your organization has an interest in. Um, getting a chance to, to show off some of your tools or your capabilities. Um, there are still opportunities for sponsorship. Next slide. Um, registration can be done at Eventbrite. Uh, here's a shortened URL, URL that you can use. Uh, also, you can go to the, to the foundation website and get there. And uh, as we've, you know, we've had to, to put a small fee on the, uh, for attendees this year, but uh, members are, are always free. Um, and um, yeah, you can you can register at the site. Next next slide. Uh, we would like to certainly thank our sponsors. Uh, this year we have three corporate sponsors who've been sponsoring our events all year long: uh, GeneDX, Rancho Biosciences, and EPAM. And uh, we have a couple of sponsors for uh, the annual meeting itself: the Hive, uh, Kyogen, and Thomson Reuters. I know a couple of others of you are thinking about. Um, sponsoring, so we uh, encourage you now's the time to, to step up and um, we could certainly use the help. Next slide. And please, if you have interest, um, you can register uh, online. There's a registration link. There's a, a link to go to the posters and register a poster and uh, a lot more details on the um, on the agenda and all are there. So please um, you know, take some time and uh, if you are able to come, uh, please, uh, now it would be good to get you registered as soon as you can, as soon as we can. Okay, with that, that's all I have, and um, pass it back to Keith. We'll introduce our speaker. All right, all right. thanks, Randy. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Raphael Rosengarten. Raphael, I'm going to find you here and unmute you so that you can introduce yourself. Okay, Raphael, we should be able to hear you now. All right, let's do a quick audio check. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. Um, and so uh, I'll just, uh, you can advance the slides from your end, I guess? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and run the slides from here. Can you see them okay? I can, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, uh, thank you, Keith. Thank you, Rudy, um, 
My name is Raphael. I'm the uh, Chief Product Officer of Genialis. Genialis is a software startup based out of Ljubljana, Slovenia, and Houston, Texas. Um, I'm in Houston right now, and uh, most of our development team and our data scientists are over in Slovenia. Um, we are very much interested in a lot of the same problems that the Transmart Foundation uh, aims to solve for its community. Um, namely, we want to help life scientists, biologists, clinicians, and data scientists work together more seamlessly to really engage with their data. Now, this is a very personal uh, sort of quest for me. I was actually a, a researcher until quite recently, until joining the Genialis team. And when I started graduate school, uh, a really busy day in the lab for me would see about you know, half a dozen 96 well plates of Sanger sequencing you know, come in the door. And I could manage that. I had hacked together enough Perl that I could somehow make sense of it. But uh, I was in grad school during the time 454 came to prominence and then faded rather quickly, and Illumina hit the scene. But I never caught up with the computational skills to, uh, to keep pace with the data. And so this became a real issue for me. I've had the great fortune since then to collaborate with some really fine data scientists and bioinformaticians. But I still feel fairly helpless when I get an email from the sequencing core telling me that my, my transcriptomics experiments are here, um, or when I go into uh, um, GEO or SLA or one of the major repositories and download an old study and want to somehow benchmark against it, I don't even know where to begin for the most part. And so Genialis aims to, to help sort of solve this problem by streamlining the collaboration between data scientists and life scientists. Okay, next slide. Now, a lot of our, our sort of value propositions and our claims are going to sound familiar. Um, again, we, we aim to solve a number of the problems that the Transmart software and the good work by the folks at the Hive and, and ITTN are, are also addressing. And so I'm going to give this talk sort of in two parts from here on. I'll describe our software, and that's going to be the bulk of the talk, um, starting with the, the front end sort of tools for biologists and users like myself, and then I'll do a, a little bit deeper of a discussion about our back end with our Dataflow engine, which is a completely open source and therefore may be an immediate um, resource to the, the transport community. Uh, but I want to touch on topics of how we help um, institutions and labs and, and individual work groups solve problems of data storage, of analysis autom automation, and this really speaks to reproducibility and benchmarking, but also to um, liberating bioinformaticians from kind of the endless do loop of essentially reformatting figures for biologists when they should be doing serious science. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about what I, how I open this, enabling non-computationalists like myself to really perform some sophisticated downstream analyses, uh, not just to sort of crunch the numbers once, uh, but to really follow our curiosities um, and our biological intuition to find deeper insight. And lastly, uh, you know, science is collaborative, so our solution also enables this uh, intra- and inter-organization uh, collaboration. Next slide, please. So let's just start on the front end. Um, the, we're going to flip through a, a few um, screenshots now of, of our software. This is the, our 3.0 web application. And again, we're focusing mostly on the front end, so this is the interface that a biologist would interact with. And this is just to show we have a powerful sample search. Um, currently, this search is for samples that are on the local file server um, in the local databases. But it can be, you, one can search uh, by any number of metadata, clinical parameters, favorite genes, et cetera. And uh, the search should be quite smart in helping people find that. And then if you look on the left side um, of the screen, actually it's not shown in this, this shot, but we also have a series of configurable filters. So in addition to search terms, one can filter their data to really uh, hone in on the, the data they want to work with. Um, we have tried to employ really the best practices in, in web design and user interface user experience in our software. So uh, the entire front end UI is built um, in JavaScript. And so everything is clickable. Um, it's a truly interactive environment. Now, a lot of software uh, talk about interactivity. And I'll go into this um, in greater detail. But very often what they mean is there's some dashboard somewhere where you can maybe control the colors or the scale of the axis or something. And that's useful. But when I talk about interactivity, I actually mean every plot, um, more information can be found by clicking on it or hovering over it. Uh, and then something happens between that plot and other plots uh, in the app because they're interconnected as well. Um, so for example, in this case, 
where you do a search and you get um, the results are, are listed as a, a table of your samples. There are checkboxes on the left of that table where one may select the samples they want to work on uh, downstream, but there's also an inspector icon, a little eyeball on the far right, and clicking on that produces uh, a new data table which shows all of the meta annotations, all the metadata associated with that sample, uh, as well as a complete sample analysis history which speaks to the provenance of the analyses, uh, what bioinformatics algorithms were run, what flags were called, what were the runtime statistics, pass fail, etc. So in this way, we're really trying to open up the black box where many people get some Excel sheet from a, a data scientist collaborator and not know how that gene list was produced and certainly uh, would be incapable of writing a method section to a paper, for example. Okay, next slide. We do offer a graphic user interface for bioinformatics. We call this our bioinformatics dashboard. Uh, the card in the middle, and I apologize, the resolution isn't coming great on my screen, so it's probably equally um, frustrating on yours. But the idea is the sample, uh, or the, the card in the middle with the blue text um, is sort of our tool catalog. These are, we have over, I think, 200 open source bioinformatics um, algorithms and applications prepackaged on the software. Uh, and it's actually quite trivial for um, a bioinformatician within a work group to add your own. So if you have custom pipelines, custom algorithms, or just something that, for example, something that's proprietary and not open source that we're not allowed to distribute, it's pretty straightforward to, to add that to this group. So here's a clickable interface where either a power user biologist or a bioinformatician who chooses not to work at the command line um, in a particular instance can set up analyses, can review the inputs and outputs of analyses and so forth. And uh, this is um, quite a useful tool for, again, for labs where maybe the person providing bioinformatics support is not super comfortable with the command line or not well versed in more than one uh, scripting language. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is the first shot I have of our visual interaction, or visualization suite. The way that we think of a biologist using data visualization is to allow them to see the same data from different angles at the same time. So rather than providing one plot at a time, we cluster or we group sets of visualizations that kind of make sense together in a workflow that would help a biologist uh, answer a particular kind of question. So in this sense, we're trying to anticipate the kinds of questions biologists like to ask. For example, one thing uh, I usually do when I get in a bunch of new transcriptomics data is to make sure that my, my replicates sort of cluster together. So one way to do that is principal component analysis. Another way may be hierarchical clustering. And we present these different uh, visualization modules all on the same page. Um, again, everything is clickable and hoverable, et cetera. So if one were to draw a box around certain samples in the PCA plot, they would highlight in the sample clustering uh, the hierarchical clustering plot below, and you would also get some additional information about those. Um, likewise, you could rerun, recompute the PCA on the fly on a subset of genes. For example, if one chose to filter the genes by some threshold or input uh, a gene list, uh, the PCA would run automatically or recalculate automatically based on the new input. Next slide. So most of the visualizations we offer are fairly, currently anyway, are fairly standard approaches to looking at data. We support things like box plots and bar charts. Um, we do have some cool tricks up our sleeve where, for example, we can create toggleable box charts where you click on it and you can get also get an exploding box plot or a violin plot instead of the standard, um, the standard box. Uh, again, we aim for sort of a, a very slick and simple user interface informed by uh, Google's material design standards. But everywhere we want the user to be able to find um, the information they're looking for. So for example, this gene info module on the upper left of the workspace, which travels along with each of these different views or tabs, um, gives the user additional information about their genes of interest. But furthermore, it allows the user, once they've selected genes in one plot, to push those genes into another visualization uh, tab or view. So if you happen to identify a set of genes that have an interesting expression pattern in one place, uh, you can go look and see how they behave in, in some other um, visualization context. 
again, the notion here is that biologists, even if they don't understand which, which are the most appropriate analyses, may have an intuition and want to explore, the, uh, explore their curiosity. The end result should be a testable hypothesis that uh, then sort of provokes or, or incites a, a new round of productive, um, productive collaboration with their data scientists and then potentially a return to the wet lab. Next slide. So now we're just looking at a few more of the examples. We have you know, uh, interactive volcano plots. We're looking at differential expression. We also build in um, gene ontology enrichment modules for doing sort of functional analysis. We also have an ingenuity pathway analysis connector. Um, this requires the user to have an IPA subscription, but it allows the user to stay within our app and within one of these modules actually uh, view the output of, of IPA pathway analysis um, based on an input gene set. Um, so in that regard, a user doesn't even have to leave the, leave the app to gain this extra information. I would also note that all of the modules are configurable in the sense that uh, with all of our, our partners, our research partners and our clients, we take pains to configure the app to work best with their workflow and their form of, of um, asking and answering questions. So if it makes more sense, for example, to put the gene ontology enrichment with the bar chart or, or with a, I don't know, a Venn diagram set or something of this nature, um, we can configure it in, in one or multiple places. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the, the Venn diagram chart that I just alluded to, um, I don't know if you guys saw, I think it was in Genome Biology or a similar journal, or maybe it was BMC Bioinformatics a few weeks back, there was a, a study released showing how many errors are published in high profile journals like Nature that arise from people sorting gene lists in Excel, where Excel will very often um, mutate a gene ID into some sort of floating point number and therefore screw up your gene list. Uh, so that's a common problem, but moreover, any biologist who doesn't know how to use R or Python is likely going to find themselves trying to compare two gene lists using something like Excel, which is kind of disastrous. And so we have a really neat interactive uh, Venn overlap module that allows users to look at different gene sets, whether they derive from differential expression analysis or our manually curated list of biomarkers or what have you. Um, all, all parts of the Venn diagrams are clickable. One can click the intersection, the union, the relative complement. And those selections, again, propagate. So any section of the Venn diagram that one selects would then propagate through the heat map, um, populate the gene info module, and could be pushed to, to the other visualization. Next slide. OK, so that's the front end, or at least the taste of the front end. I want to talk a little bit about um, our data flow engine. So, while I, I started this talk, and, and again, from my perspective, the really uh, valuable aspect of this is allowing biologists to engage with their data. We've also built a very powerful underlying um, data flow platform for data scientists and for computational biologists. Now, this is built on a, a Django framework. Everything I'm going to talk about now is open source. And on the next slide, I think I have uh, actually the link to the documentation and to a place where you guys could download it, install it, play with it. Um, now, we call this Resolve uh, with a W instead of a V to make it more Google, Google searchable. Um, our Resolve uh, open source package is a set of libraries. So this is not something you can download and just execute. But for any institute or lab that does have a, a savvy computational biologist who wants to think about integrating um, our data flow framework with whatever the, the sort of in-house solution, uh, that would be fine. We also have a series of APIs and SDKs, so this can be linked very neatly to other solutions. For example, we've worked with one research partner to link our platform and our front end, especially, with the Transmart uh, database. So um, when I, I titled the talk a compliment to the Transmart community, I really mean that um, for whatever overlap there is in functionality, we think our software actually um, takes a slightly different approach to both data management analysis and could serve as a useful complement um, to, to what you guys are working on um, and have been working on you know, doggedly over the last few years. At any rate, uh, the way that our data flow package works, we have these APIs that communicate to the outside world and to the visualization layer. We've got this data flow engine that's built 
really on a lot of cutting edge technologies, especially uh, the Docker paradigm, um, where all uh, analytical processes are run in, in uh, Docker images. Um, this is really quite essential because it allows us to partition uh, each analysis, uh, providing a number of benefits, such as version control, provenance control, um, the resolution of dependencies. That's actually where the name of our platform, Resolve, comes from, this idea that you never run into dependency issues because all of the, the local dependencies are installed in that Docker image. Um, it also allows for very easy uh, parallelization of, of workflow. So if you have to run 96 samples or 384 samples at once and you happen to have multiple cores, um, you can spread the Dockers out over those cores. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this slide's going to be more or less illegible, but it's just a screen grab from the website. So if you look at the link at the top, resolve, read the docs.io, this is where you can learn more about, um, about our back end. Um, I would encourage anyone who's interested in this sort of thing to take a look. It might be interesting just from a software architecture point of view. But again, if it's something you'd like to try, um, by all means, give it a shot or be in touch with me or, or our tech team, and we can talk to you more about um, doing a pilot of uh, the Dataflow engine. I would also note that while we do provide, you know, as I mentioned, a couple hundred pre-configured uh, open source bioinformatics algorithms, and we have a bunch of our own validated pipelines, the real beauty of our software, in my opinion, is that we don't try to enforce our pipelines on a user. Um, rather, the, the whole software is meant to help developers, to help computational biologists package what works best for them uh, to support their particular use case. Next slide, please. Um, just a, sh a very small example of some of the tools that come uh, pre-installed. Um, you don't have to sit here and read it, but you can rest assured that it's many of the, the validated and, uh, and widely used tools. And anything that's missing, again, it's quite easy for you or for us to add. Uh, next slide. Uh, that tool catalog, by the way, is, is available in exhaustive detail on the web at the same uh, Read the Docs link. The last thing I'd like to talk about is, is the SDK. We set out just to build a simple Python API. Um, but then we got a little carried away and decided to really build it out as a software development kit. And we've been doing this in close uh, consultation with a number of researchers at Baylor College of Medicine here in Houston, uh, as well as with some of our, our pharma partners in, in Central Europe. The idea is to give people who are more comfortable with command line complete programmatic access to do all of the sort of data management, permissions uh, management type stuff that, that you might do from graphic user interface but also to really be able to build out additional tools and applications to run on the back end. And already we've had some really great uh, pilot success in doing this with uh, various computational biology labs that have some quite custom analytical needs, helping them uh, package their, their algorithms and wrap their pipelines um, in a fairly simple way. Uh, this also really helps system administrators, um, like I said, maintaining sort of provenance and uh, user permissions, customizing particular things, configuring workflows, et cetera. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the full documentation for Resolve SDK is also available on the web. So lastly, I'd just like to highlight these two points in, in summary. We're really aiming to empower non-computational biologists. Um, but the other side of that coin, again, is to liberate the data scientists. Uh, we hear over and over and over again from our collaborators that they feel, data scientists often feel that they're being treated as service providers. You know, they'll get an angry email from their biologist collaborator saying, you know, where's my remapped reads? Uh, you know, I, I was expecting this three, three days ago. When in fact, a lot of these kinds of rote and solved problems are automatable and should be automated um, for the sake of reproducibility and also for the sake of your sanity so you can go back to doing real science. So we've really built out the back end to be simultaneously powerful and flexible, um, hoping to let uh, bioinformaticians and data scientists stretch their legs and uh, do the kind of science that they're trained to do. Next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to quickly plug a talk. I'm going to be speaking at the um, uh, conference that we mentioned in San Diego. Um, I'm going to try to mix that up so it'll be different from what I've said today. I anticipate uh, presenting a real use case uh, that we've done with one of our partners um, who's a Transmart member. 
and uh, we can talk more then um, or offline. Uh, but I'd like to leave a little bit of time for Q&A if we can. The next slide. I know that we, we Genialis, are a bit late to the dance as far as Transmart is concerned. I'm actually overwhelmed by, by how extensive the collaboration is and how well thought out the different needs are in regards to data analysis, um, data availability, dissemination, et cetera. And I recognize that a, a number of you may be thinking, well, this is kind of a, you know, redundant with a lot of the tools we've already envisioned. And that may be so, but I would argue, again, that there's a lot of room for sort of complementation and complementarity here where some of the visualizations, or at least the approach to it, we've conceived of, uh, you know, add some value on top of what you're already going to get with SmartR. Likewise, some of the data management tools and the fact that we can connect so easily and seamlessly through the Transmart APIs means that your internal data can be managed in a much more seamless way and connected uh, to that of, of Transmart and, and other repositories. Um, so I'm eager to hear other people's perspectives um, and field questions about how we can collaborate, um, I'm quite open to, to almost any suggestion. Thanks for your time. Okay, great. Thank you, Raphael. Uh, it's, it's nice to hear that you're going to be at the uh, annual meeting in October. Um, I'm going to open up the uh, floor to any questions. If you, if you have a question for Raphael, please uh, raise your hand. In the meantime, Raphael, I am going to ask uh, a question or two. Um, one is, uh, could you just briefly um, Describe the types of biomarker and genomic data that uh, the work, uh, the data flow engine supports. Sure. So the data flow engine is completely agnostic to the kind of data and kinds of analyses that go in. Um, the limitation there is simply in terms of what visualizations have we conceived of, and to the extent we can configure them to the data, the data that comes out of the bioinformatics analyses. Um, but it's, again, it's built to be very flexible in that regard. Right now, most of our focus has been on transcriptomics, uh, microarrays to an extent, um, and we're working more and more now with people doing chip seek and, and sort of methylomics, that sort of stuff. So a lot of the visualizations, I mean, you saw it's like dot plots and bar graphs and things. These can very easily be repurposed to any kind of data out. But I would say that the area where maybe we're a bit weaker or lag behind other solutions currently are for things like GWAS or, you know, whole genome variant studies, that kind of stuff. Um, we've simply, with our research partners thus far, had less of a need to focus our energy there. I can tell you, though, that that is changing. Our roadmap includes a lot of progress um, towards supporting that. Now, in terms of biomarker analysis, again, the, the analyses that one wishes to run are, are entirely up to the, the uh, data scientists and how they choose to um, configure those pipelines. Okay. Um, and one other quick question. I, know, I think it was hinted at on one of the slides, but um, could you talk briefly about the deployment options? I mean, are you, uh, yeah. is it easy to deploy to the cloud or internally? We, or to we support both the cloud and local infrastructure deployments, um, and we've done both. So we, and we have clients in various places that simply express a preference. Um, frankly, our preference is cloud just because it's easier to maintain. It ends up being cheaper for everybody. Um, but I understand that not all organizations are um, either comfortable with or allowed to, to do that yet. Um, so in the, the one real use case where we've connected to the Transmart uh, data, for example, that was on-premise at a Transmart member's site. And so, you know, our, our software was installed in a closet somewhere on their building. And we actually did the um, Transmart instance installation and upgrade for them as part of the service agreement. And, you know, just had, we built a connector module um, through the APIs to, to bring data in, et cetera. Um, we have yet to have a use case where we've pushed data out to Transmart. I don't actually know how you guys handle that. But to get back to your question, cloud or local is fine. It's just a, a question of preference. Okay, great. All right, well, I don't see any hands raised at this point, but um, we do look forward to meeting you in San Diego in October, and uh, that will give people as well a chance to read the documentation on the website and uh, sort of frame, frame their questions for October. Great. Let me just um, reiterate that all of the resolved stuff is open source, so, you know, it's free, free for you guys to use and try. We'd be happy to, you know, consult on setting up pilots, et cetera, to the extent that it's useful. That's the point of it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Raphael. And uh, if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll feel free to post uh, these, this PDF on our website as well. 
Absolutely. Thanks very much. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, one other uh, bit of housekeeping. Um, Rudy, I think, uh, I can't remember, did you already, you mentioned that um, there will be a new set of uh, registration links coming out for, for the uh, community calls because this is the last in our series of 12 for the year. So right. um, That's right. Keep, keep an eye on your inbox for uh, a new, I guess it will come in the form of an invitation um, and you can sign up for the next set of 12 through September of next year. Um, Okay. Um, if, are there any other questions? Uh, if anybody wants to raise their hand, I can unmute you. Uh, if not, we'll uh, we'll wrap up just a few minutes early. Okay. I don't see any questions. So uh, sure with that, the opportunity to speak. Oh, certainly. Yeah, and like I say, we uh, we look forward to meeting you in San Diego. Um, all right then. I think that'll do it then for uh, the September meeting, and we look forward to seeing everyone again in October. And then, uh, well, Rudy, will there be one in October? Uh, it may come very close to the. Yes, meeting. it'll be the week before the annual meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone, and see you next month. <laughs>